you know, John Aaron and I had a little business doing industrial models, and uh, basically we got the work any way we could, which was usually by undercutting the cost of someone else that was doing them, you know, and not making much money at all. But so all, all of a sudden along comes, uh, you know, uh, ILM and wants us to work for them. And John and I had the uh, forethought to think, hmm, money. Uh, and uh, thought, uh, well, yes, we would like to work on your project, but we don't want to lose our clients. And, of course, we have to be compensated for the amount of money that we would be, our shop rate, blah, blah, blah. And it's reasonable that if we bring our skills and our talents to, to you that we should be paid a blank, you know, at least our shop rate. And they were like, oh, okay, you know. And then Grant McCune, who was the head of the model shop, uh, about a month later, two months later, we got to kind of know him. He said, you know, when you two guys showed up, you were the best thing that ever happened to me. And I said, well, how, what do you mean? And we thought, well, it helped him, it helped him. You know, he said, no, it's like you know, my salary went up immediately because you guys asked for more money than I was making. And they couldn't have me, <laughs> you know, working uh, with two guys that made more money than I did. So my salary just went up <laughs> instantaneously by a good percentage, you know. That's great. And, and, and we were faking it, too. I mean, uh, John and I were just starving, really. Uh, well, yes, we had the shop, theoretical shop rate, but it didn't bring into our business anything like that. So uh, John and I uh, really lucked out you know, when we asked for a certain amount of money. Our, our salaries just, you know, the actual our intake that year, that year just <laughs> skyrocketed also. John Errol and I had tried to maintain our contacts um, at nighttime, we made models at nighttime for other projects, industrial design, because we didn't. Want, we thought we, if we lose the clients, we'll be in trouble, you know. Because we had Kikaman soy sauce, and we did things for Yamaha and um, JVL speakers and things like that. So we would take off every once, so like at lunchtime. We did these extended lunch times with sandwiches while you drove to see somebody you know, at that, get there so that as soon as they were coming back for lunch so that we could talk to them and get back to Star Wars. And, uh, of course, we were starting to get these giant bags under our eyes from working um, late. I mean, we'd work sometimes till 12, 1 o'clock in the morning and then get up at 6.30 and, you know, get ready and get, get to ILM by 8. Joe Johnston, who was uh, a friend of mine and was in the year before me, or ahead of me, rather, uh, in industrial design, had been working on this, what we thought was a B-movie, doing you know some stuff on the side to pay his way through college, and uh, he was designing spaceships for it. So I went and interviewed on that, and I got the job of building models for that. So it, it all kind of melded in together. If I hadn't been going to Cal State Long Beach uh, for an industrial design degree, uh, and I hadn't built all those models before that, I probably never would have been in the right spot at the right time to get that job, which got me into the film industry. John, John er Erlen and I were originally hired for, I think it was either two weeks or two months. I can't remember which one it was. And uh, what we were hired for was to help solve the problem of the uh, Death Star, because it, it, it had to be multiples in foam. You know, it was like big stretches of area. Well, the Death Star was, you know, interesting, uh, but it wasn't as fun as you could see in the other room. They were finishing up uh, the princess's ship, which was originally had been the Millennium Falcon, but, but they changed that because it looked too much like uh, the ship from Space 1999. And uh, so they were starting to do the Millennium Falcon, and that was like, oh, that's what you really want to dig your teeth into, you know. And uh, so John and I, you know, augured towards <laughs> towards that kind of thing. We still did the other one. We still did Death Star, but uh, we started to uh, head in that direction. See, John and I, had, since we had industrial design background, we knew a lot of technical information and pro processes that uh, the other guys didn't necessarily know. And uh, so one morning, I saw them working on the ship, and they would take five-minute epoxy, and they'd put the part on, and they'd put tape, you know, hold it in five minutes, five minutes, mix up a little bit more. And it was just at the time in 75 that um, superglue had been invented. 
I think the Japanese were the ones who invented it. And the first brand was called Eastman 910. And it was not available, uh, you know, you wouldn't go into a hobby store and find it. You had to go to very special adhesive places to get it. And it was much, even faster than super glue is now. And um, so what happened was um, I came in one morning with a bottle because we had some in our shop. And I took a pencil and I put it on the table and I said, everybody, stop for a second, take a look at this. And I put it off at like five degrees or something like that or two degrees. And I put a little super glue in there and then moved my hand away. You know, and the pencil was stuck there at two degrees, sticking up in the air. And it was like this gasp in the room, you know. Like, oh, how'd you do that? You know, and, uh, you know, well, let's see that glue. What can it, what is it? And, you know, all the models from that point on were made with super glue. And it, uh, you know, you just imagine how it speeded things up compared to, uh, you know, tape and five-minute epoxy. So it, it made quite a difference, and, and it was probably one of the reasons why, not, not just that, but multiple things like that, that why um, John and I stayed not two months, but two years to 20 years to, you know, all that kind of stuff. John Erland stayed at Apogee. I, I came up here uh, after we did, when we started to do Empire. We were all kind of young, and uh, only a couple of guys there, a few guys, had worked on any feature films, anything like that before. And those were guys uh, that had worked on silent running with Bruce Dern. So they had built some of those miniatures, worked on those. So they had an inkling of, of what was going on and, and where this movie was in the scheme of things, you know. But I don't think anybody knew when we were working on it for most of the time, we thought it was a, a, like a B-movie. It had some funny design stuff. We had seen some black and white temps coming over from Europe, from England, of uh, Carrie Fisher as Princess, Ar uh, Princess Leia. And uh, she had these, her hair up in these big buns, and it looked really kind of funny, you know. Uh, and we thought, I don't know what kind of movie, you know. Uh, but of course, when we saw what they called the NATO reel, which was, I think it's National Alliance of Theater Organ Owners or something like that, uh, they put a 15 minute reel together to sell the movie to, uh, to see who wanted to uh, distribute it and who would pay for the rights to distribute it. And when we saw that reel, uh, it blew everybody away. We knew when we saw that, that this was going to be a biggie. Uh, and it was just, I can't tell you the, the, the feeling that everybody had. It was like, I've been working on that? <laughs> you know, it was just, it was hard to get your head wrapped around. It, it, yeah, even to this day, I haven't, I've never worked on anything else that you quite got that kind of feeling about, you know. From then on, you're hoping to get that high again, you know, of building something and really putting your all into it and even working harder than, than any of us probably did on Star Wars and not having it come back with the same payoff, you know. Uh, there's, there's plenty of films that I did better on that I, I think I contributed more on and, and even had learned enough stuff to use more tricks of the trade or things that we came up with ourselves. Uh, but the overall show didn't capture all the things that Star Wars did. The, the, the model shop was small enough, I think we had seven people in there for most of the time, that everybody did everything. I didn't, but there are, there's a few things that everybody didn't work on that a few guys did. For instance, the sand crawler. That was, I think that was Steve and Joe and Bill and Grant McCune. Grant McCune was the head of the model shop at that time. Well, always. And uh, he was really a good, a good guy to work for too. But for the most part, I think I worked on everything else. On Star Wars, I started out as a model maker, but for the last half of my 13 months on that job, I ended up being the model shop person 
on stages at night when uh, they were they were getting into a time crunch. So Richard Edlund would shoot on the day shift, and Dennis Muren and Ken Ralston and I were the night shift. So Dennis Muren was was the the cinematographer, the the cameraman. Ken Ralston was his assistant, and then I would handle the miniatures. And if Dennis said, you know these these wings, as they get far enough, uh, get further away, the wings are disappearing in the eyepiece, so I know they're not going to make it on film. Can you do something to lighten them up so that they show up? And so it'd be left up to me whether to put, you know, we had some white tape that I could put on the wing and then do some lines and a little bit of aging so it doesn't just look, you know, abnormally white. Or I could use chalk or some other techniques to plus out the model for the shot. Or if the camera ran into the model while they're programming it. And it sounds silly and you, and you think that somebody would have to not be pay, paying attention to what they're doing to do that. But some of the time the computer would just go haywire and it would decide to run the, the camera back to the start position which might mean that if it ran straight back to the start position as it's backing up, it might clip a wing off of the model that it just had moved around. Uh, so there were fixes like that, enough to always need a model maker on stage. So I became that, that night shift person. And in doing that, I learned uh, so much from Dennis Muren. I, I knew the principles of photography. I had learned that in college, but I, I learned the art of it from Dennis. In California, especially on Star Wars and Close Encounters, uh, the model makers were allowed to see dailies. Everybody knew they sat there. They got to hear the director and, and the supervisors and all these people say, we like this, we don't like that, get somebody to change this. And so People could take that information, go back, they could feel good about themselves because they got to see what they were doing on camera, and they felt part like they were part of the production. I, I, I sometimes describe it as like the whole group, because it was cast and crew, and it's almost like we all took a gasping breath at the same time and like sucked the oxygen out of the room. It was like, <gasps> all of a sudden, it was just like it's an amazing dynamic that happened in that room because we'd all only seen little bits and pieces. We had not seen it with uh, sound. We hadn't seen it with, uh, you know, um, music. All that kind of stuff that really added to it. And uh, so that that experience, that especially from somebody who had not worked on films before, was just extraordinary. It was really extraordinary to all the people in that room too. We knew we were having fun. We knew we were getting paid to do th something we all loved. We weren't getting overtime. We weren't getting paid that much. But, but we were working on something, and, and it was fun.